making and thinking and thinking to make and talking about thinking about making. <laughs> Welcome to the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka. You can find me elsewhere online as The Crimson Stitchery, such as on Instagram or in our Ravelry group. And as always, links and show notes for this video can be found in the down bar here below on YouTube. Thank you so much for being here with me for another episode of my Knitting Plus Other Things podcast. Knitting and speaking and rambling and making and drinking hot coffee, which I think you can just about glimpse. I've got a very hot cup of coffee that I've just finished brewing. Um, a few months ago, quite a while ago, um, a viewer very kindly bought me a coffee on Kofi.com. And she bought me quite a few actually. And she said, you always say in your videos that you're drinking cold tea or cold coffee. So please buy yourself an insulated mug. And I thought that that was so sweet. Um, I didn't buy an insulated mug, but um, just that, that little anecdote just um, crops up. So thank you, my viewers are the best and so um, kindly. Uh, but recently I did treat myself to a very, very beautiful hand thrown um, ceramic mug. It's been thrown on, on a wheel uh, and you can still see all of the rings and the ridges from when the clay you know goes up and down and your hands uh, move it. <laughs> pottery novice here, I'd love to be good at pottery. And um, hang on, I did a ridiculously bougie thing and I bought a mug which came with a matching ceramic coffee filter so it hasn't got the coffee grounds in it, I put it in the sink so that I could show you this but it's matching um, and it's just from a, a potter on Etsy, bought directly from him um, so I was really happy with that. Um, it's just so nice to buy something that you use every day that really does feel like a work of art um, and I'm really into ceramics, you know, I am not letting myself learn anything to do with ceramics for good reason because I'll just never do anything again. Um, there's so much that I love about how it's really tactile, how it's a very meditative process. I like the fact that you have to go into a specific space for it, into a clay studio, which is completely different from knitting, right? Because you can just bring it around with you, you know, it's portable, it's small, it's dry, you know, knitting and, and kind of small handwork. But anyway, I love ceramic and I'm very happy to support another maker. So this is completely, completely unsponsored, but I will put a link down below uh, with the name of the Etsy shop. I think his name was Tim. <laughs> Tim Fenner? I'm not sure. I'll put it down below, totally unsponsored, but just to be nice to a fellow creative. Um, yeah, good karma, good karma. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. As always, this episode of The Crimson Stitchery, number 53, has been made possible thanks to the wonderful support by my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for keeping this channel going through your monthly membership subscriptions. I always love hearing from you. So if you enjoy the Crimson Stitchery, if you've been thinking about, you know, maybe joining our Patreon for a, li for a little while perhaps, um, do head over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery to check out what you can get um, in return for your monthly subscriptions. And also we have a quarterly knit, like, knit night, which will be coming up at some point in April. So I will be posting details about that shortly. So thank you so much to all of my Patreon supporters, <laughs> as well as everyone else who continues to watch the channel. Okay, preamble aside, put that down. I've got a pile of woolly things to the side on the coffee table here. Um, rec uh, not recent, long-term viewers will know that I've recently upgraded my setup. I have a new camera. I used to pull things out of a knitting basket, um, but it's a bit hard to get that in frame at the moment. You can just about see my tulips on the side. Um, so I'll just have to be pulling things out of the side like that. And in this episode, I've got knitting, crochet, mending, and then at the end, I'm going to do conversational threads. I'll give you a little bit of an update about what's going on with me behind the scenes. Just a brief update. I'll try not to bang on for too long. And I'm also going to be sharing some thoughts about um, compassion and self-compassion and staying positive, um, kind of in light of... <sighs> I, I mean, it's not re even really recent world news events because the news has been nothing but dire forever, it seems. Um, but, you know, just just it, just in light of that um, to, yeah, just 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 say a few words um, about that. But I'll do that at the end in case anyone wants to avoid any potentially heavy or sad topics. So we'll start with what I have been making. And I'm really happy to say 
that I have finished. Yet another pair of socks, surprise, surprise. <laughs> so um, here they are. Now they're actually um, my sock pattern. Aha. They're the oregano socks, which is a cabled sock. And I've got to admit that I did pull them out of the laundry basket. And this is a stashless project. So um, for the last couple of years, amongst people in the Crimson Stitchery community, I'm not quite sure what to call everybody, most broadly, Crimson Stitchers, Crimson Knights, drop me a comment down below if you have an opinion about that. Um, but yeah, I've been doing the stashless year very, very loosely. Um, and so that just involves knitting from your stash in a nutshell. <laughs> and so it was really good to tackle some more of my sock yarn stash, which I did mention on this channel um, back in January. So I pulled out this orangey autumn leaf kind of burnt orange coloured um, sock yarn, which I bought quite a few years ago, intending on um, working it up into a sock sample for a design and then change my mind about the colours or something like that. So it's Novita Nala, which is a commercial Finnish sport weight sock yarn. And it's very, very cheap. Uh, it's less than £10 for a ball and you get like a big ball with which just goes on forever basically you know a lot of generous um, meterage meters to grams you know ratio um I think you could get it from John Lewis in the UK you could order it online um I was told by a friend from um, a knitting group that we both used to go to hello Nomi if you still watch I don't know if you do um who at the time was uh, living in Finland. I'm sure she said that she saw Novita Nala in, in grocery shops that you could just pick up with your, you know, snacks and apples and stuff. So I thought that that was pretty cool. So Novita Nala, I really like it. I, I know that there's a big, obviously, movement towards moving away from superwash sock yarns, but as far as they go, I think that this is extremely affordable and, you know, um, holds up, holds up pretty well. And there's just something about making socks in sport weight yarn rather than fingering weight yarn that just makes them go so much quicker, just have like a few less stitches per round somehow, it just makes a big difference. And then they're, they're not too thick to wear in normal shoes, you can still wear them in your boots without kind of feeling really like your feet are just stuffed in. So I really like that. Um, so I, I had this yarn and I didn't know what to do with it. I thought, oh, should I do another design? Or, you know, in the end, I just decided that, um, because I wanted to have more cabled socks. So I decided to cast on again, my own pattern because it has such a nice 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 cabled pattern it's really fun and I did pull these out of the laundry basket so they're a little bit uh, dusty and crumpled I'm afraid to say um I ran out of yarn because um I had been naughty and I had put the orange yarn into another project before making the socks so I was like Oh, whenever I knit socks, I always have loads of leftovers. So I'll use these left these pre-leftovers in a so-called scrap project, multicolored project. That was a total mistake. Um, <laughs> shouldn't do that. Don't do that. You know, <laughs> learn from my mistakes. Just, just use leftovers when they're leftovers. Don't make pre-leftovers because this is not the first time that this attitude has bit me on the bum. And the reason for that in particular is because cabled socks use more yarn. That's just what happens. They use more yarn, there's more stitches because they're being twisted around in the cables uh, and the tension's different. So yeah, cabled socks always use more yarn than normal socks. So I didn't have as much left over as I had thought. Um, so then I had to knit the toes in a contrast yarn, so another leftover in a dark brown. Um, this actually was real leftovers and it was leftover from my gothy cola bottle coloured ice pop socks sample which is this like mesh lace ankle sock that looks very gothy I really like them but I haven't really worn that sample very much because I've sometimes I wear my samples to like test them out and kind of give them a test drive for myself see how um they wear see how the yarn you know works out long term and stuff like that and sometimes I keep them for best just in case they need to be sent off for display or re-photographed or you know even give away as a gift so yeah I haven't really worn them very much which is a shame because I really like them so I may end up knitting another pair of mesh gothy socks to myself. Um, I love the pattern. There's a very fun little cable twist around the cuff which is like it's actually quite difficult to work but it's only one or two rows so it's like after you just get through that the rest of the sock is plain sailing so yeah. 
left uh, leftovers for the toes and stash for the sock. And yeah, there was just something so comforting about um, knitting a project that I'd done before, that I'd done several times before, in fact, I'd, I'd knit the oregano sock sample twice. Um, or three times? Was it twice? Can't remember. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just relaxing and I think that knitting things twice is, is something that I used to do a lot more but when it came to recent years of like trying to use up my stash and trying to use up you know my pattern stash like all the patterns that I've bought either downloads or in books and stuff like that or um what else you know like designing stuff from scratch and I just every, you know everything was always about like on to the next thing on to the next thing so there was something very very comforting about just kind of relaxing and not making anything for really any purpose but just doing it as a sort of exploration so I highly recommend that highly recommend putting way less pressure on any of your crafts uh don't make things into a side hustle it gets very <laughs> exhausting very quickly just enjoy your hobby you know and um, there's always this constant pressure I'm just touching upon you know the idea of finding balance between what you're making like everything that you're making doesn't always have to be for a thing for a purpose and and for a deadline like it can just be for the sheer pleasure and the sheer joy of just doing your hobby um, and that's something that I really you know that's kind of the theme of this month's podcast episode it's uh, something that I've been trying to figure out for myself since I am doing more designing on a you know professional basis so yeah I'm just trying to find balance aren't we all <laughs> so these are the socks Okay, um, another thing that I finished finally is these colour work gloves. This is something that I cast on way back in the autumn, I think it was in September. Um, yeah, they're done. <laughs> what to say? This glove is from the book Warm Hands, edited by Jeanette Sloan and Kate Davis, and Jeanette kindly sent me this copy for review, so thank you so much Jeanette. Yes, this was a gifted item, but obviously all opinions are always my own. So this is what they look like. So the glove is called Blue Interference by Claudia Fiocchetti and it's done in grey, cream and blue worn by this very happy girl. She's so happy to have these gloves. Good for her. <laughs> She's so happy. Um, I thought that that was cute but I didn't want the multicoloured fingers, I wanted to make them a bit more boring <laughs> essentially and a bit more me colours so I went for charcoal grey um, which is tuku wool sock and that yarn is a quote unquote rustic you know non superwash uh, woolen spun yarn that contains 20% nylon, around 20% maybe 15 um, so it's like rusticy but then with the nylon for the strength and that's the grey and it's sport, sport way, I think. Um, so I thought that that would be a really good choice for the gloves because it would make them quite durable, especially if I wear them on my bicycle during the winter, you know, it would mean the gloves would be quite hard wearing and be less likely to wear away. I'm really gripping my handlebar. I have a road bike, so I'm kind of down on the handlebar gripping it quite a lot. I, I used to have like a lovely upright Dutch style bike, fake Dutch style bike, uh, not a real Dutchie. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that was more upright and a lot less pressure on the handlebars, but now there's quite a lot. So I, I had that in mind with the nylon. So that's sport weight. And then the contrast yarns, um, the red one is whole super soft and the light gray is a Shetland lace weight yarn. And you can see that they're very crumpled because they've not been blocked. Um, and that's just because I was really happy to share them with you. Um, as you can imagine, there are a lot of ends to weave in as well, you know, lots of ends for each finger joining it in between all the different colours and all of that sort of thing. So doing the finishing has been a bit of a labour of love. Um, I shall put one on. So this is a colourwork glove. I, from what I can recall, you only use two colours at once. Um, even though there are three colours overall and I just really didn't enjoy making them because I don't love colour work. Um, I did it on bamboo DPN needles in the end because I tried um, Magic Loop and then I tried my like trusty higher higher shops that are so slippery and strong 
that it just made the knitting even more difficult. So actually having the bamboo with the flexibility and the fact that the points weren't too sharp so they didn't stab me too much um, made a really big difference. So I've been definitely noticing the difference about uh, needle tips recently. Oh, and that's another thing for the socks that I want to say is that again I knitted these socks on bamboo DPN needles whereas normally I go for my high high sharps either DPNs or uh, Magic Loop and I can't remember why I chose the bamboo uh, sock needles I think probably just because the other things were uh, you know being used in other projects um, but the bamboo double pointed needles are much blunter than the metal ones and obviously they're not slippery at all and it just felt really nice in my hand um, the bamboo was so pliable, the wood was so soft uh, and you know it wasn't heavy or anything like that and it was warm to the touch, it wasn't cold when you pick it up and all of that and I never got scratched by the needle tips. So yeah it was a slower but very very pleasant experience. So that was quite an interesting thing to discover actually how the tactility of the needle material has been really affecting me recently. Um, before that, you know, a few months ago I would have just said, oh no, I swear by my high high sharps, they're so fast, they're so glossy, I'm not bothered by the points, even when I've sat on them in the past. <laughs> Ouch, really painful by the way. You know, before I just always would have gone for speed, but actually <laughs> um, there was something incredibly pleasant about using the bamboo and not having to do things too quickly. Saying that with these gloves, because they were done on 2.5 millimeter needles, you know, it, it did feel like the project went on forever at a certain point. So I did have to kind of sit down and force myself to continue, especially to make the second glove. So yeah, I just didn't enjoy making it, especially because like the calf, it's not, it's like a half twisted rib. Um, so it's like knit one through the back loop and then purl one in a different color. So it's not that you slip the colours, uh, is that called a corrugated rib? You know, it's actually one stitch, one stitch in colour work, but it's a rib and it's twisted. Just wasn't fun. <laughs> one day, I keep saying that one day I'll be better at colour work or I'll enjoy colour work, but that day is not coming. <laughs> it's not here yet. So I'm happy that they're done. They're very long, so they're going to be really good for the bike because when you go on a bike and bend your elbows, um, typically your jacket sleeves tend to ride up. So, you know, hot tip for anyone who uh, is knitting for a cyclist in their life. Um, it's quite nice to have a really, really extra long cuff to uh, fill that gap. So yeah, haven't worn them outside yet. Um, oh yeah, I was talking about the yarns. So there were three different weights of yarns. Whole Super Soft, which blooms up and does all sorts of crazy things. I made a whole video series about that, which I'll link to above if you are new to the channel or if you're curious about what I'm talking about. Um, then we had a lace weight yarn and a sport weight yarn. So three different yarn weights. And I often get asked, especially when I talk about my stashless and my scrap projects and my leftovers projects and my, you know, throw everything together and see what you can do with it projects. You know, people often say, oh, can you make a video giving advice about how to combine different yarn weights? But I mean, I, I have considered it. It is on my list of video ideas, uh, a list which continues to be longer than my arm. Um, <laughs> but the thing is that you just need to do it and see if it works for you because, you know, all of the yarns are going to be different. And in this case, all of the yarns were like uh, woolen spun. So they had that in common. They only had two or three plies. So they were quite hairy yarns. You know, they had a lot in common. And, and also, you know, I had the thick yarn as the background and the thin ones as the foreground. So I had like the thin ones kind of sitting on top of like a thick, hairy background. So, um, I mean, it's not perfect. The gloves would definitely be better if all of the yarns were the same weight, for sure, because the, you know, just the yarns would just grab onto each other more and it would just be more uniform surface texture. But you know, once I block it fully, um, I will really, I will really know. So I've been thinking about maybe trying to video that, but like I said, I'm never, I'm never without things that I should be making videos on. So anyway, if you have ideas about what you'd like me to make, always feel welcome to just drop it in the comments and I'll add it to the list if I think it's an idea that I'll be able to tackle. Um, there's no there's no harm asking, politely. <laughs> so yeah, here are my two finished objects. I'm pretty happy with these, even though they're quite small and, you know, I've got more stuff to finish, but I'm, I'm happy with what I've done. 
self-compassion. <laughs> Trying to practice more self-compassion. Get those there. Ooh, those gloves were really warm and really quite kind of firm on my hand, which again is going to be good for cycling. So another project that I want to share with you is crochet, two projects, and here we are. It's all got to do with granny squares that I've got here. And you'll have seen these before. So firstly, my granny square bag, um, I started this ages ago, maybe, yeah, last summer. I think I even finished crocheting it last summer. But the reason that I'm showing it to you now is because not only have I joined everything together in terms of like, so I made, um, <laughs> I made 18 granny squares out of scraps. I'll just start at the beginning. Made 18 granny squares out of scraps, leftovers, sock yarns, everything in different weight. Then I crocheted them together, nine and nine. And then I did stripes down the edge of the bag. So I had my two squares, joined them together around as stripes. Then I went round the top and then I started sewing in the ends. And that took months, absolutely months. So here's the inside, here are the guts, as they say. Yes, you see? You see, good as the other side, it could even be the right side. Ooh. There we go, so that's taken ages. So if you don't remember, and quite frankly, why would you? Um, <laughs> I got the idea for this bag um, when there was this Vogue article that I saw in Ravelry about uh, handmade bags, crochet and macrame mostly. And it was, it was probably during one of the lockdowns. It was, there was a lot of restrictions and the only place I was going to was the supermarket. So I thought if the supermarket's the only social outing that I'm getting in months and I might as well make a beautiful handmade bag to wear to the supermarket that's good enough to be, you know, <laughs> sold by a mainstream huge couture design house. Now apparently COVID is over in the UK. This is what, this is what they're now, they're now saying. <laughs> As usual, we're glossing over the news at the Crimson Stitchery. We're taking a really broad sweep. According to the UK, COVID is not a thing anymore, apparently. Um, uh, and I still haven't finished the bag. So <laughs> what I've got to do is I've got to line it, um, but I also want to make um, at least one zip pocket in the lining. And the reason that I need to line it is because it's so stretchy that if I put heavy things in it, like, you know, apples, potatoes, nice healthy things, yoghurt, <laughs> bottles of milk, who knows. Um, if I put heavy things in it, like groceries, it, it will stretch and distort and warp out of a shape. So it needs a woven lining in it to try and hold its shape a lot more. And then I wanted to order some leather handles off Etsy and just kind of use press studs to put them in. So that again, you know, I don't want to I don't want to have a fabric strap and I don't want to have a crochet strap in case it stretches out of shape because I have suffered that with another crochet bag that I made before. So I'm really pleased to show this off. It's not the last that you've seen of this, but I feel like anyone who crochets granny squares will feel my pain and agree that saying that, you know, you've sewn in all of the ends is like a huge milestone. But what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? I started another granny square project shortly after that with another million ends to sew in. So, so again, this is a little bit of a long-term scrap crochet project. And have I been naughty at using pre-leftover yarns? I may have been, <laughs> it's quite likely, um, but I'm trying to move away from that habit. So I've, I've done, um, I've got to make, I keep, I keep dropping them. This is going to be, they're just dropping everywhere. This, <laughs> this, set of granny squares is themed yellow, pink, teal, cream and grey. So again it's a very strict colour scheme. Here we go. Um, that one, that one and it's got woolly woolly things, merino-y slick things and shiny shiny things. I think that's the best way of putting it. It's got a bit of navy in it as well. It's navy with some shiny, shiny. Get the idea. And I've got to make a 
about 64 granny squares. I am approaching the halfway mark. I'm approaching 30. I think I might have, don't know, 25, <laughs> something like that, 24. Um, and it's gonna be a, yeah, it's gonna be a bed jacket. I was originally thinking that it might be a howdy, which has the long, you know, the dangling, um, vertical dangling kimono-esque sleeves. But I don't know if I can be bothered with that. I might just simplify it and just make it into a boxy bed jacket with boxy sleeves with like, you know, 16 squares on the back, 16 on the front, 16 on each sleeve in theory. I'll probably do some triangular ones at the front around the neck um, and then like go around the edging again. So approaching halfway, I just had a really good stint on this and I really, really enjoy just finishing a square and then arranging them on the floor and looking at how it's coming together and all of the colours are coming together. It's a really, really enjoyable pursuit. And then I recently put these full, you know, just threw in a full yellow one and there's a full pink one as well, just to try and add a bit of variation on that. So I'm just throwing them all on back on the floor now. <laughs> That's another project. Um, I remember that another viewer commented a little while back about the granny squares. I think they said something along the lines of, oh, I only buy granny square blankets from thrift shops because then I don't have to sew in any ends at all. And that made me laugh <laughs> quite a lot. But, you know, scraps and leftovers continue to haunt me every time I think I've used up <laughs> a lot of yarn. I just find more. Um, I am still working on stashless, working very hard, but you know, you can only do what you can do. So, <laughs> just take some coffee. Yeah, I'm really, really enjoying that. And again, it's nice to have something that's totally unrelated to, you know, deadlines and all of the rest of it. Um, to do, I just like to do it while I'm watching undemanding television. Yes. <laughs> mm. What I'd really like to know actually from you guys, if you don't mind dropping me a comment with a recommendation is, please can you recommend me some simple projects because I have a tendency to make things complicated, right? <laughs> like I think that I'm making a few granny squares in order to use up some scraps and then before I know it, I've landed myself with like a very precise and strict color scheme. You know, I'm, I've got these big ambitions and all of the rest of it. Um, there is definitely something really nice about having a long-term project too. But I would just love to know if you guys can recommend any simpler projects for me to try that I can maybe, you know, add, add to a list or, or something like that and just have at the back of my mind. So yeah, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you um, in advance if anyone does that. Aside from all of the crochet and ends and all of the rest of it, I've been retackling my mending pile. So Mending Stories was a regular part of the podcast in the first year because I had a big mending pile and I ended up working through quite a lot of it. And now the mending pile has grown again, which is only natural. You know, we wear our clothes a lot and therefore they show the signs of wear. Um, here I have just a very bog standard machine knit fine gauge wool sweater. It's cotton and cashmere, so it feels really nice. And I tend to wear this to sleep in, especially in the winter. It's nice to have a cotton cashmere jumper in bed because it doesn't get too hot because of the cotton. And uh, it's just really snuggly and lovely. Um, and it is a little bit moth-eaten, I think from an old attack. You know, this is a this is a very old jumper, but you know, was it might have even been thrifted to, to begin with. So it's been in the freezer multiple times. So that's my uh, hot tip. You know, if you find clothing that has got moth damage, put it in the freezer for two weeks, put it in a plastic bag and the freezer for two weeks. And then you've got to like shake it out outside, you know, you can lint roller it and all of the rest of it to get rid of any eggs and larvae and then tackle mending. Um, so it had been getting quite worn in different places and there's already little little darns that I've made and shown on the channel a long time ago. So here was a little bit of a frayed bottom edge that I did a darn in a contrasting steel grey colour. So I decided to stick with that and the area that got some wear was at the bottom of the sleeve, um, the cashmere had worn away 
and just left the cotton mesh. So it's quite similar to when you have like the heel of a commercial sock wears away and you have the nylon mesh. So what I did was I did duplicate stitch. So I had a very, very thin um, darning thread. So it was like in between a lace weight yarn and a sewing thread, somewhere in between and a bit hairy. I think it's probably synthetic. Um, and it was a darning thread that came free with some sock yarn because there's a brand called Lang Jawohl, who I believe are a Swiss German company. Um, it just makes me want to say that, Jawohl, you know, <laughs> to the wool. At least the skein that I bought, you know, they tend to have, they tend to sell their sock yarn with the yarn and then inside a little bobbin of matching coloured darning thread, um, which you can either use to mend your socks or you can use it as a reinforcing thread and kind of knit along um, into your sock heels and so on and so forth. And I think that that's great. And if there was like a local yarn shop or something like that near me in London that did stock that yarn, it, it would probably be one of my, my go-tos to be honest with you, um, because I have a fantastic range of colours and I just love having that matching darning thread. It's, it's so handy. So yeah, that's what I did. So pretty, pretty simple little mend there, but it's very, very satisfying just to be able to do these, you know, short little projects and just get a piece of clothing back into rotation very quickly. So um, if mending is something that you've been considering starting or, or tackling or learning, I would highly encourage you to just do it and have a go and you will only, only get better. You know, sometimes you have to experiment and work out the best way to do things for you and sometimes things go wrong and <laughs> that's kind of, that's kind of just part of it. I, I do, I have come to think of mending as an adjacent craft to both knitting and sewing. So yeah, mending stories will now become a regular part of the podcast again and I'm, I'm really happy about that. So yeah. Mm, I now want to move into conversational threads uh, toward the end of the podcast. For anyone new, conversational threads is essentially where I talk about what's on my mind and I often draw together stories around popular culture, philosophy and thinking um, through into craft, kind of like about the culture of making and sometimes I do random things like read poems, haven't done that in a while but yeah it, it's the thing making and thinking and thinking to make and talking about thinking about making <laughs> um, essentially part of the podcast that I love and then after that I will Give you an update about me yeah so um what i want to talk about is um as i said at the beginning compassion and self-compassion um because uh europe uh, is at war or there's a war in europe that's probably a more accurate way of putting it because uh russia has invaded ukraine um and is committing horrendous war crimes and you know the news of that of that is everywhere people are very upset about that you know civilians in the uk um and it and it and it's horrible <laughs> it's horrible i'm i'm acknowledging this and feeling like i'm being very trite and i am i apologize if if that is the case i am not a news anchor i'm just a normal person that's a designer and a PhD student that's just thinking about, about how to articulate these things. And I'm just trying to acknowledge it. So I'm gonna put that out there um, because I don't want to ignore it. And a lot of people are very upset, understandably so. And I think the reason that I'm touching on this is because so many times when it comes to, for want of a better word, horrible, inhumane things happening in the world. It's very easy to get very, very despondent and to think, what's the point of doing anything? You know, what what I'm doing has no meaning or purpose as I'm, if I'm not, you know, working for an aid agency or something like that. And there can be a feeling for people who are not in a disaster zone that are, that our privilege is not something that we should be allowed to enjoy or, or acknowledge when essentially other people have it a lot worse, okay? And other people do have it a lot worse. Let, let's just, let's just agree quite frankly there. 
Um, yeah. So the way I've been thinking about this and the conclusion that I've come to is that in times like this, kind of compassion for other people also extends towards ourself because it doesn't help anyone if we torture ourselves. And I would encourage anyone that's able to donate to war relief, you know? I've done so. I've contributed to like a fundraising campaign by brands. Um, as an example, and you could also di donate directly, obviously. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that it, we also have to go on living. Everybody has to go on living and find a way to continue looking for the brightest and best parts of the human experience, which includes the joy of being alive and the joy of creativity. You know, I'm coming from the perspective of, as a designer. So I'm feeling like I'm sounding very trite. You know, the thing is that like during the pandemic, I, I got really depressed and I got really despondent. And, you know, one of the many thoughts up that I had was what's the point of doing anything? What's the point of creating, making, enjoying art, reading literature, any of that stuff, if people are just dying all around me. And, you know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when all we did in the UK was watch a rising body count, like completely, completely sadistic, uh, sorry, masochistic activity, like a torturous, self-torturous activity of just watching a graph of a body count going up every day and feeling very frozen and feeling very, very stuck. And what I realised was that like, I went on a big long journey over the last two years, have had some really, really dark moments that I have briefly alluded to, but chosen not to go into in depth, right, because it's it's private, essentially. But the conclusion that I've come to is that, you know, as individuals, we're not really going to be any good to anyone else if we continue sort of, if, if we don't even live our own lives and don't appreciate the joy of being alive as that is being taken away from other people. So, the way that I'm thinking about this is because, for instance, um, so in my family, um, my uh, grandfather is Polish and uh, was a refugee to the UK. Um, they're not Jewish. They're not Polish Jewish. They're Catholic. Uh, they're in a concentration camp, essentially. Um, yeah. And ended up coming to this country, like had, you know, uh, the most horrendous experience. And I've been thinking about this recently in terms of sort of intergenerational trauma because I didn't go through that experience. He did. And even his children didn't go through that experience. He did. And, you know, for I think like 70 years of his life, he never talked about what he suffered in a Siberian work camp at eight years old. And then it all kind of came out when he wrote his memoirs in his 70s and, and self-published it. And like no, no one knew that this had happened to him. And I recently discovered that this silence is very common or can be very common amongst Holocaust survivors. And I think because my family are not Jewish, I wasn't quite sure how to make the co connection like ethically for myself with you know the Jewish community um and su Holocaust survivors um but the, you know the fact was that they were captured by the Nazis they were kicked out of their home they were put on a train they were sent to a camp uh then they got handed over to the Russians they were sent to another camp you know just horrendous stuff and one thing that happened was that my grandfather and his mother and aunt 
they had these pillowcases, they had these pillowcases that they had embroidered and they put, when they were being captured, they just quickly grabbed what they could and they put it in a pillowcase. And they dragged that pillowcase through this horrendous exodus all the way through Siberia and then ended up walking down to Iran before they became refugees and came to the UK. And then when I went to visit my grandfather, because I don't, I'm not very close to this side of my family, which is another story for another day. But when I visited his house at, when I was age 15, he had these framed embroideries in the hallway of his house. And he said, these, these embroideries are the embroideries that my mother, aunt and grandmother did. They are the pillowcases that we took with us to this country, you know, through many countries, you know, it really was an exodus. Um, and again, this is all very difficult and I'm probably not phrasing this correctly and I'm not meaning any offence because exodus is obviously a Jewish word. Um, they're not, they're Catholic. Um, I don't know, there's just something about the framing of the embroidery and the hanging of it in the hallway of a house. So every day you're walking in and out and looking at this tangible reminder of survival and what is it it's embroidery it's women's embroidery on a pillowcase and to me you know if that is not a testament to the significance of creativity in daily life and the importance of the use of textiles and art and craft in order to sustain your human presence and feel joy even in the most like horrendous, unimaginably horrendous circumstances. I don't know what is. Let's all keep making things. Um, I hope that that story was okay to share. It's something that I am really struggling to come to terms with, especially especially a few months ago when there was a lot of news coverage about the treatment of refugees at the Poland-Belarus border. That really got me. And I thought, why is that? Because it didn't happen to me, right? It didn't happen to me. But never, never have, never have they been resentful of the fact that I've not suffered like they had to suffer. This is what I'm feeling. And this is what I'm trying to get across. So it's really important to have empathy and self-compassion and not to allow inhumane, horrible war crimes and nasty acts that happen every day on the macro and on the micro level to kill our own lust for life, enjoyment of life and appreciation of the gift of being alive. So <laughs> that's what I have to say about the situation. There's a lot of family stories. There's a lot more that I could tell you on both sides of the family. You know, I'm not going to. <laughs> um, thank you for listening if you have done. Now I'm just gonna quickly wrap this up. Um, <laughs> the Crimson Stitch Tree is going towards a once a month video schedule at the moment because I'm writing up my PhD, hooray! <laughs> and I am so delighted to say that I have now drafted all eight chapters and half of a conclusion, which means that I am moving into redrafting, hooray! And although that is tons of work, because I have to rewrite the whole thing, you know, update all of the research that I've done over the last few years, yada yada yada, there's still loads of work, but I no longer have a blank page. I no longer have a blank page. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I've still got a long time before the deadline, a long time, um, but I'm trying to pace myself. So because of that, you know, everything else with Crimson Stitchery and all of that has been significantly slowed down. And I really thank you for your patience and for your ongoing support. Um, I really, yeah, I really mean that because it is, it, it can be, <laughs> it has been such a lifeline, honestly, um, to know that there's, there's other people out there who are enjoying making things and making connections with me as well. So I'm continuing on my kind of very focused one thing at a time game plan. <laughs> Um, and, and it's working out. Um, so yeah, that's a little a little happy update for me. It feels really nice to give you give you a happy update. Um, and I'm going to wrap it up for, there for today. So thank you very much for listening. I will catch you again next month for a podcast. And as I said, I'm incredibly grateful to everybody who supports this channel, either on Patreon or by buying me a coffee. Cheers on Kofi. 
And a shout out to my supporters at the Crimson Queens tier this month, it's Angie Scheitel. So thank you, Angie. If you're interested in joining me on Patreon, as well as meeting lots of other lovely people you get to chat with on our private Discord server, do head over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery. Until then, happy knitting, happy crochet, happy mending, <laughs> happy being alive, um, and yeah, cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>